Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we have out on the internet. Go to focuscompound.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. And of course, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, we do manage capital, uh, reach out to me at Andrew at focusedcompounding.com. So in today's podcast, we are going to uh, revisit the idea of um, knowing where your return comes from before you enter into a stock or where it could come from. And the blog post that sparked this podcast is actually one from John Huber uh, titled Three Engines of Value, Guest Lecture at NC State. He has a Substack, basehitinvesting.substack.com. I will put all the links down in the description. But in a, a, a world currently where everybody's focused on NVIDIA, and speculating about future years, we thought it would be great to revisit this topic of understanding where your return comes from. The three engines of value is what John Huber calls it. And then looking at a few different situations to really demonstrate this on the podcast. So he had talked about, and you could actually, if you go to the link that I'm going to put down there, uh, there's actually a link to a, a lecture that he gave or a presentation video that he gave that's about an hour long, but how uh, the three simple factors that drive each stock's price over time, he writes, is earnings growth, change in PE multiple, and change in shares outstanding. And he had uh, written about how one of the things that is often overlooked in the stock market is how valuable it is to have a low valuation. And that is true. So we could uh, walk through a few different examples. Uh, but first, before we do that, Jeff, I just want to hear your general thoughts on this topic. A lot of times before going into an actual investment or uh, thinking about the valuation of an investment, you know, we've talked about a lot. We don't care necessarily how much a stock is worth. We care about how much it's going to return in the future and really think about from like a free cash flow plus growth perspective. But, you know, assuming these three things, earnings growth, change in PE multiple, change in shares outstanding, I just want to hear, you know, what your overall thoughts are on these three engines of value. Well, I use different three engines, two of the three the same. Yeah. Earnings growth, um, change in the PE multiple, and then the yield, meaning the yield in terms of um, free cash flow yield. And when we talk about earnings growth and PE multiple, I'm really using you know my estimate of free cash flow. But um, so in that case, you're talking total return, and if you have dividend, then that would add to your total return. And uh, if you have uh, cash that you're that you're using to buy back stock, that would obviously change the number of shares outstanding. This is good for telling where the stock price will be, but sometimes your return might come from a combination of things, including a dividend. Yeah. And what's good about the way that we do it, a lot of everybody could do it themselves, is really you have your opportunity cost. Let's say your opportunity cost is 15% per year. You could see what multiple it's trading at, and you could see like what the current yield is and really work through the math of, hey, how can I hit this 15% per year or better? Um, you know, and, and work through it like that. I think a good example of a stock that we've demonstrated before in the past, and we could work through a few different ones just to show people is OTCM. And we could walk through how you would think about the current valuation, the current yield, the multiple here today to get like an idea of the total return profile going forward. And then we can look at NVIDIA, which is just the poster child for a stock currently that obviously is trading at an extreme valuation where a lot of that value is years into the future. So maybe take us through OTCM and how you would generally think about uh, the valuation here today. So the valuation of OTC markets is high. And that means that you're less likely to have multiple um, expansion, which can be important. And you might be more likely to have multiple uh, contraction. But you have the current yield that you get from it, which could be dividends. They pay a dividend. Or it could be um, buybacks. They don't really buy back a lot. 
but they do pile up cash on the balance sheet. Um, and they acquire things. And so that acquiring of things would change the earnings. Um, I, I should say, you know, we're talking about earnings like assuming the same business and going forward. Obviously, if you have more yield on a stock, that in the, the uh, company can go out and buy things and increase earnings or it could buy back stock and increase earnings that way. The important thing is just that you don't double count. So OTC markets, you know, if let's say we assume that the um, we want a 10% return before or else we would sell the stock and hold cash or something, right? So the question is, would you keep holding the stock at 20, 25 times earnings? Basically, the free cash flow is equivalent to the earnings in this case. The conversion you can see there is very high. So um, if you're at, say, a 20 or 25 times multiple, so you're at 4 or 5%, if you think that it will grow 5 or 6% a year, you know, and, and basically what we'll be thinking of here is probably the nominal growth in the financial sector, right? Is the financial sector going to stay about the same size as the rest of GDP? Is GDP going to grow nominally at rates like that in the U.S.? Um if you think that markets are going to grow over time by numbers like that, then it's okay, right? But it's not looking great that way. And the easiest way to do that is to look ahead some set number of years and to keep in mind um, sorts of rules of thumb for that, right? So the one I encourage people to use usually is five years. I always say don't use shorter than three or longer than 15, Um because if you really like a value stock and you go shorter than three, you can always make a case, you know, that it be the multiple expansion alone will get you your return. And if you really like a growth stock, if you go out more than 15 years, you can usually come up with numbers that would justify buying it regardless of price. Um, so with OTC markets, 20 to 25 times earnings is okay for getting like a 10% return. You were talking about 15% return. That'd be very hard to do. That would require the company to grow at almost 10% a year, which is possible. Over the last 10 years, it did grow revenue that fast. Um, but, you know, the last 10 years were good 10 years for the overall stock market, good 10 years for speculation. Most companies, you know, are going to grow slower in the future than they did in the past. That's usually the rule of thumb is if they grew X last decade, we should assume it's some some fraction below one of X, 0. Point something X um, going forward. So it, it can justify prices at 20 or 25 times only because all the earnings are in free cash flow um, and because you expect that growth. If you stopped expecting the growth, then it wouldn't make sense. Um, but you still do have problems from contraction. So a good thing to keep in mind is um, people like the 16 times PE idea. Right, like that's the Schiller PE average or whatever. I see people plug in a number of 15 or 16 times a lot. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a value stock as being something at 10 times earnings, easy rule of thumb to keep in mind is to use a hurdle rate of 10%, which is pretty close to probably a little better than what you'd expect the market to do. Um, and if you do that, what you're going to find is that an expansion from 10 to 16 over five years will add 10% a year to your returns. It's because the one, to, so if you multiply something by one raised to, you know, in this case, we're talking about 1.1 to the power of five, right? Or whatever. But we're going to be talking about things that raise it to about 1.6 times or so, right? And so it's a very convenient number, five years, 10%, that gets you to 1.6, a little bit more than 1.6. As you go out in time period, it will have your return each time you double the time period your compound return. But it's it's very easy to keep this in mind. So if you're making the estimate over five years, an expansion from 10 to 16 is going to add about 10% a year to your returns. If you go out to 10 years, it's now going to add about 5% a year to your returns. It's important to keep in mind, though, if you go out to 20 years, it's still going to add between 2 and 3% a year to your returns. It's not uncommon for a stock that you think never gets reappreciated by the market um, there's no catalyst, whatever, that it will be 20 years and then it'll be sold for 16 times earnings or something instead of the 10 that you, you bought it for. And the reverse is also true, going the other way. So from about 10, in that case, to about 6.5 or something, would get you about the same, you know, PE. It would be about the same idea as going from 10 to 16. Um, now, that's possible with stocks. We've talked about that. That's one way that I do look at it is I say, okay, well, how far could this compress how far could this PE multiple contract and we still get 10% a year or something? 
So, you know, we're talking about something that we were looking at the other day. It was a value stock. It could go to about four and a half over the next five years, and we'd be okay. So the other things would provide enough return that losing 10% or so uh, from a contraction over five years from whatever that P would be, let's say seven or something, um, would not be that big of a problem, right? I mean, it wouldn't be good. You'd be upset that, oh, I only made 10% a year. I could have done that in other stocks. But you would the having such a low price helps out a lot that you could end up at a PE of less than five and you'd still get probably returns that are like what the market has. Um, so it's good to keep those things in those rules of thumb in mind over certain time periods and ideas of how big that what that looks like in terms of compounding and everything, especially with the idea of like the opportunity cost to understand that what it has to do. Um, because a lot of times I think people use sort of like the same they they're going to exit at the same multiple they enter at or something or don't take into consideration the time period involved. Does it help you with like setting the expectations right? So like a company like OTC M that's already trading at 21 times free cash flow. You're not really going into it when you're thinking through the math in your head, I imagine, thinking oh it's going to go from 21 to 40 times, right? You you may even assume, okay, maybe it'll revert back to 15 to 16 times, sort of that average Schiller PE, or maybe it'll stay here at 21 times. But to justify this investment, you get the 5% free cash flow yield to hit your hurdle. Okay, if it's 10%, well, can you get 5% growth? Or if you're looking for higher returns, um, you know, you'd really want to think about, okay, yeah, can it continue with 11% or 12%? growth over the next 10 years or whatever. So you're kind of going into it with the expectation of, I'm not thinking about this as I'm going to get multiple expansion. I'm going to be solely focused on uh, the growth, which really, if you're wrong on the growth aspect, not only will you lose out on that side of the equation, but you could also experience multiple contractions. So I just think it's really under mm -hmm. it's good just to go into it and kind of thinking through this way of thinking about value and returns and stuff, just to really understand, okay, where can I get hurt? What should I be solely focused on? What are the drivers that are going to make this investment successful or um, unfortunately not successful? Yeah. And it's hard to do because if you take the example of like you know, OTC markets, right? Against peers, it actually would be expected to have 1.6 times higher multiple, at least, right? So it, you could easily have someone write it up and say, over the next five years, I expect this stock to gain 10% a year from multiple expansion, even though it's already in the 20s PE, because what are its peers? And they're going to list a bunch of stock exchanges, or they're going to list you know, different um, financial information services things. They're going to say a Moody's is a peer, a FICO is a peer. You know, When you start doing that, then, of course, yes, the entire group looks like it's trading at 30 to 50 times PEs or something. And so you say, oh, yeah, you'll get an extra 10% a year that way. This is to say, take those three numbers and play with them to say, okay, what happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? And then we mostly look at it from a margin of safety perspective. What we're looking to do is to make investments that we think are really, really likely to return 10% a year over time. And then they actually return more. Um and my experience has been that the multiple expansion aspect of it for me in terms of my portfolio has produced about half of the returns that you see in it. Um, so now this doesn't sort of break out what we're talking about with the buybacks and everything. So it complicates things. It, it means that if some stocks that I owned had buybacks, then the underlying growth would be lower. But if you say you're getting returns of, say that, you're getting multiple expansion of uh, eight to ten percent a year, but returns of sixteen to twenty percent a year. Then that means that half of it's coming from growth and half of it's coming from expansion in the things. But the expansion part is very big in things that I invest in. Um, the growth part is also bigger than like the average for an index or something. So even though I consider myself a value investor, the truth is that over time the earnings of things that I've bought have gone up more uh, each year in earnings per share terms, at least, which could include buybacks than you know the Dow does or the S and P does or something. But still a very large part of the return comes from uh the multiple expansion or contraction, in this case expansion. Is that just given the the nature of the way that you invest? Because very rarely are you going to pay twenty times free cash flow unless it's a company that does look like OTCM and they have a moat in what they do and uh the a vast majority of their earnings converts to free cash flow, et cetera. Um, so do you think that's why half of your returns have come from multiple expansion? Cause you do skew more on the cheaper multiple side. Um, 
Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, I think that you end up selling the stock faster than you expected. That the so the compound annual growth rate is higher because the turnover in your portfolio tends to be higher because like some of them get bought out and stuff. And so you get in those, you get large expansions in terms of the multiple when converted into compound annual growth numbers. And back when I was in a uh, pre financial crisis, for instance, everything was being taken out that I owned by private equity. Um, you know, years later that changed, but before the crisis, you know, any value type stock would get taken out a big premium by private equity. And so that would add a lot because in two or three years it would get taken out. Um, the other thing, though, is that it's the expansion or contraction that matters. I don't want people to overstress the idea that it's a cheap stock. Um, that can be a mistake. It's whether the multiple makes sense versus the quality of the business and the future that it has. Um, there's nothing wrong with high multiples that might go to even higher multiples if they're reasonable for the stock to have. And so... Um, Sometimes it's buying, it, it can be buying a, a, you know, so let's say banks today, there's some banks at six times P, but there's others at 12. It could be that the the one that has more likelihood for expansion over time for you is the one at 12, if it has features that are more attractive. Um, I've rarely ever paid a, a OTC market is about the highest P that I've ever paid and we bought it at a lower P than it's at today. So um, we tend not to pay high PEs, but I have for, say, insurance companies and banks generally paid PEs that are probably in line with what banks insurance companies traded at the time. The difference is you're buying, say, progressive, right, which you think deserves a higher PE, and yet they people would say that's a normal PE for an insurance company at the time you bought it. So it, it really is based off of not the idea that there's some certain multiple that the thing should be at. Um, so taking the example of OTC markets, it's a much better business than an index. So if the index historically had been at 16 times earnings and this was at 16, I wouldn't be too worried about buying it and seeing that there's a real p potential that it could get to 25 or something. So you actually could get as much multiple expansion in it as you would at buying a subpar business at nine or 10 times PE. Um, no matter what though, the yield will be lower. Right, so if you do that, that's the thing to keep in mind is the price aspect affects both the multiple expansion or contraction risks and return possibilities, but it also it hits the yield issue. And that's something that um, John Huber talked about writing that up in the, uh, in the you know, talk is how much of an effect that can have with the, uh, stock being uh, cheap over time, right? So he's talked about that before and things with stock buybacks and stuff. Um, the... The thing that confuses people is like a Dillard's, right, or Jewett Cameron. Um, the The issue there is, one, the likelihood that you won't have multiple contraction between two periods and that you could have multiple expansion, but also that the buybacks would be done at high returns. Um, so, for instance, like take Jewett Cameron, never has grown, but since it's used, both of those companies, I think, have bought back like 70% of their shares over time. So it, they've returned most of the capital that the business produced in earnings. And as long as their PEs were like 10 or less, they've returned them at better returns definitely than the market. To understand, I don't think the market could have cash on cash returns for your average business in the index higher than 8. Um, they report higher numbers in terms of their returns on equity and EPS things and stuff, but they've written off stuff. A lot of it's not cash earnings. I don't think that really they achieve much higher than eight. They certainly don't achieve 10. So these businesses, if they're able to have a return on equity of around 10% or something and then buy back all the time at a discount to book, that means that that yield that we're talking about then turns into increases in, in EPS and stuff. Um, and so that's how it's possible, you know, because otherwise it doesn't make sense to me when I say something like, like in the Jewett Cameron example, that's a net net. And yet over 30 years, it's done better than the S&P 500. How did that happen? If it had been an expensive stock, it would have been hard to have it happen that way, you know, to understand, to get the same return if it had never bought back stock, um, it's multiple would have to be, you know, um, what would it have to be? And now it would have to be a, like a $14 stock or something. Instead, you know, if it never bought back shares, um, the equivalent of that, like that the multiple loan would have to be so much higher. So you can offset a lot of that by buying back stock. Um, you know, and another, so it can, of course, have some cases where the P is so low 
that you could have a what looks like a value investment on yield and stuff and it doesn't work out. Um, but it's pretty rare. Right now, the only things would be like coal companies, maybe some steel things, some oil and gas production stuff in the United States that their multiples are so low um, that, that, you know, that that could happen. What about a company like uh, British American Tobacco? PE, seven times. EV to free cash flow, six times. Return equity, great. Assets, great. Re asset growth, revenue, uh, growth, steady. Uh, gross margins. I mean, this from a quantitative perspective looks like a company we would be interested in. Mm -hmm. So a few things. One, my memory is there's cheaper slash better tobacco companies in other parts of the world. Not that many, but um, I think Scandinavian tobacco, which is not cigarettes, and I think uh, Japan, there's a, a tobacco company too, are both you know in line or or better and have as good or better positions. Um, but you know, some of them you have to look at the debt situation, obviously, and then some of them you have to look at the the um, likelihood of them producing higher earnings in the future, which is a big problem. So generally, these things have structurally declining unit volumes they expect, but they don't expect pricing power to decrease, and they don't expect that... Um, you can do a lot longer term to change that. So year to year, you can change market share by cutting your prices a lot, like to clear inventory. So if you get in a situation where you have too much inventory, which is much more likely with Scandinavian, which is cigars, than with British, which is cigarettes, um, then you could have a problem where prices fall. And then you also have prices surging when your inventory is short because sometimes you have stock outs. But longer term, they know they can't encourage people to take up cigarette smoking, let's say, for example by just having low prices, nor can you discourage that many people by having high prices. Their reasons for not smoking are societal reasons, like they can't find a place to smoke and stuff. So um, because of that, you have to be able to have your prices increasing over time and your capital allocation being really good. Um, if you don't, then it's a question of whether you deserve a very high multiple or not, or you have to have the ability to be sold to another company, like for it to be allowed that you could be acquired by a different company. Um, a lot of it comes down to the capital allocation stuff. So you would need to know how much they're buying back or how much they're paying out in dividends, how much they're raising prices, how much they're doing acquisitions at or spinning things off and stuff. It becomes very, very significant because the structural decline thing for most of them is pretty similar. Um, so you're going to have... And then the other factor here, and this is the thing about projecting the future of using something that makes sense. Like I said, with OTC markets, you probably want to use something that makes sense in terms of financial sector and stuff. These do change a lot depending on your expectations for inflation. So if you have a business that has real unit declines over time, but has pricing power, those are much more um, appealing if they uh, have a high inflation. So if you're trying to compare British American tobacco to Tesla, knowing how high inflation will be in the future is helpful. If it's the 1970s, then you're you're thinking the multiple in British American tobacco should be higher than you would otherwise think, and on Tesla, lower. Tesla's very real stuff, not very pricing-driven at all. British American tobacco is not very real, very pricing-driven. Um, in an environment in which you have higher inflation, the, the on-reality of certain earnings becomes less and less important and doesn't matter. So remember, all your investments and stuff really are being done in nominal terms. And so um, you want to get away from stuff that that um, has unit volume gains and towards stuff that has pricing gains um, when you have inflation, just like relative to what you would otherwise have. If you knew there'd be no inflation, then then companies in tobacco stuff are less attractive and companies that have real gains all the time, whether technology or, or um, the, you know, electric cars or other things that gain each year in terms of volumes um, are more attractive, but it does depend. That's one of the few macro things that I think shifts it um, meaningfully is it would be harder for these companies if you knew there'd be no inflation. Let's talk about the other end of the spectrum uh, really quick. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA currently at 117 times PE or EV to free cash flow. I mean, if you took the, oh, like a multiple contraction going from 170 to let's say 20 over 10 years, I mean, that's a, negative 19% Kager, right? When you want to work that into your math. Um, 
over time, even if it is growing revenue at, you know, 60% or 50% or whatever it is for the foreseeable future. That's just some stuff that you probably want to think about. But how would you, if you were to explain the other end of the spectrum, just for people to be aware of what to look for and stuff, how would you use this approach to talk about NVIDIA? Well, it's pretty easy. NVIDIA has no yield because its earnings are almost nothing compared to its stock price. But in addition, they also have said they're going to buy back stock. And actually, the amount they announced is as big or bigger than what they're likely to produce in cash until they double the size of the company. It's $25 billion, right? Yeah. I mean, they, I don't think they've ever produced more than $6 billion in distributable cash flow in a quarter. Um I think even if you assume they double it, that that's probably about what they could do in free cash flow because the, there's investments in working capital and stuff. So if the company doubled again, maybe it would do $25 billion a year in actual free cash flow that could use to buy back stock. But the point is, you're not going to get any return in terms of dividends or anything else from the company. It's going to be used to reduce the share count right now. Um, obviously, those returns are not so good if the stock price is high. Um, you can do some pretty easy estimates. What is the market kind of assuming? So if we assume that the you need to have a, um, let's assume the price has to go up 1.6 times over five years because you want a 10% a year return in it. Then you're saying, okay, well, how high does sales have to go for the sales multiple to get to a reasonable multiple? Now, there are a few companies right now that are over 10 times sales. Historically, almost nothing over 10 times sales is going to work out unless it's a venture type thing. Um so 10 times sales as your exit in five years seems reasonable as a multiple to have. I don't know if it will happen or won't happen. Today's sales are, what's today's sales, did you uh, tell me? It said it was 37 uh, times sale, uh, 26 point, 27 billion. It was tw 2023, but they're ramping up. So What's their uh, price to sales ratio, 37? Yeah. Okay. So if we assume that, um, we're going to have to assume that they need to get to about, um, I would say you're going to need, if the company doubles this year, which it should, at least double, in terms of sales, forget earnings. It'll, earnings will go up even more, but the earnings thing is too wobbly because um, their gross margins are high. The gross margins will eventually come down. Um, so if you assume sales double this year and they double next year and they double the year after that, um, that's not going to be great versus the, uh, versus our expectations for what the price of the stock would be, but it would be okay. So if the company can octuple, I'd say in less than five years, you can see a path to having, um, good returns. So what do they do in sales now? That's not crazy. I think some estimates for analysts is that they can like octuple if you assume that they get the majority of the AI stuff. Um, you said sales this quarter were what? Thirteen point five billion. So thirteen point five billion. We assume there's no seasonality, so it's fifty four times uh, fifty four billion. We assume eight times. So if they get their sales up to about four hundred fifty billion in five years, um, then you're talking about something that I think that could beat the market. Yeah. And the multiple holds at, let's say, high, let's say 10 times or something. You know, you're getting to numbers that it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, other things will come down. Like what, if for the most recent quarter, what's their gross profit margin and their operating profit margin? For the most recent quarter, we have 70% gross margin, operating margin at 50%. Right. So obviously that will come down. Um because one of two things will happen, right? Either there'll be competition, um, which will bring it down. Well, there's three things that could happen. The third one's not likely. But um, competition, that could bring it down. Or they'll simply not be able to supply enough, right? If your margins are that high, at some point, that means that you're in too short supply. And so you can't supply enough. If you can't supply enough, someone else will be able to supply some. So some people will buy other things just because they're available. So either you'll have pricing issues through competition with things that actually can compete with you, or you'll have pricing issues because they'll just be buying of other stuff because there's no way to get their hands on your stuff. That sounds crazy, but at some point you would be supplying like probably big companies and stuff, but smaller companies would have trouble getting their hands on what you were selling if you're really going to have 70% gross margins, 50% operating margins for years. Um, that's not common except for something that's in a constant state of um, short supply. So 
Um, but like I said, it's not impossible. I think there are analyst estimates that it could get that high. And that's not totally unreasonable when we're talking about that in relation to like U.S. GDP. And this goes outside the U.S. too. But um, it's not crazy. You can compare it to things like advertising, cloud computing, things like that. If, if There's probably people who believe that AI spending overall will be as big as those things. I don't know how much of the spending will go to NVIDIA. If you assume that like there's no related spending on it and 100% of it goes to NVIDIA, then you can come up with numbers where it's easy. The problem is, of course, like how much of their products really of the overall spend that you would need to do on AI. Like internally, there's a lot of things you'd be spending on. And so then we get to numbers that sound kind of high compared to GDP. If we're spending several percent on AI, that that does sound high. It's not impossible, but it does mean that you're kind of spending higher amounts than people spend on, you know. Like I said, like you're getting to points where you're saying people are going to spend more on AI than on advertising. uh, um, On AI than on, you know, uh, storage, basically data storage. Um, I don't know. People would, you know, have a better idea of that than I would. But those would be things that I would kind of use as benchmarks of, well, I don't, I think it could get as big as that, right? But when you start getting bigger than that, you have a bit of a problem. But it might have, maybe somehow AI has much broader applications than, say, the things I just mentioned. It's not going to have broader applications than advertising, but maybe it has broader applications than data storage. Maybe more companies want AI than want data storage. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding podcast. If this is the first time you're tuning in, make sure you hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, reach out to me at Andrew at FocusCompounding.com. And of course, uh, go to FocusCompounding.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff coming all the way back to 2005 for free. I thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us, and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.